the meeting will be record recorded, but we will turn the recording off at the questions point so that you can, you know, we can just have a completely uh, open um, di uh, discussion, but the recording will be available in case there's anything you want to refer um, back to. Great. So, um, as, as I've, re I've mentioned already, this is that this is a three-part um, webinar, so I probably don't need to consider that any any more. So, um, just to really cover the the kind of essential purpose of uh, of our program and of this grants mechanism, um, and it's all about uh, realising um, the nature-based solution that peatlands offer. Uh, both to restoring biodiversity across the Welsh landscape, but also in terms of regulating greenhouse gas emissions from Welsh peatlands. And um, these two photographs kind of illustrate the two extremes of our peatland resource in Wales. So the image on the left is of a good condition peatland uh, with a nice high water table. In this state, this peatland will be hanging on to the carbon that's become stored in the peat profile over millennia and will be uh, weekly um, uh, releasing some components of the greenhouse gas flux, but will be a net um, sink of, of carbon dioxide overall. And the image on the right is of a heavily degraded eroded peatland where all um, greenhouse gas um, you know, components are emitting to the atmosphere. And uh, 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 that will be a strong net carbon dioxide um, source. And uh, in the 2013 baseline year, it was estimated that emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, for Welsh peatlands altogether amounted to uh, about 500 kilotons, 500,000 tons uh, expressed um, in, in their uh, equivalence to CO2 uh, per year. So that's clearly an undesirable state and uh, we're very keen to uh, reverse that trend and to reduce emissions um, as, as much as we can. And the uh, all of this work that the kind of kind of policy foundation to it um, uh, stems from Welsh government and a, and a specific uh, ministerial ambition to bring our peatlands with semi natural vegetation into favourable management, and then also to begin restoring um, our most modified areas of peatlands. And we'll talk a little bit about what those look like in a moment. And that ambition relates very nicely to the declared nature and climate emergencies in Wales and. Peatlands really represent a kind of unique um, coupling um, it, it, uh, between nature and climate. Uh, and as I've already said, you know, peatlands in good condition are best uh, able to hang on to carbon and to lock carbon up and to deliver a whole range of other ecosystem services. And the whole um, uh, intention to set up our national peatland programme, that's it, it, it very definitely enshrined in policy uh, and the um, the net zero Wales carbon budget too has a specific policy relating to the setting up of the of the peat programme. So uh, it's a very sort of mainstream and topical um, piece of work. And so far the implementation of that policy has been to establish our peatland programme, which uh, began in 2020. And up until about 2025, uh, we're getting an investment of, of around about a million uh, per year with a target restoration area of about 600 hectares. And uh, in, in every year so far, that, that target has been has been exceeded. So the programme has been going well, and that's in no small part uh, due to the support of our many uh, uh, partners across Wales. Um, so in order to deliver that ambition, our published National Peatland Action Programme, which is available on our website, um, focuses restoration in the six main contexts context in Wales where degradation happens. And these are kind of listed on the uh, right hand side in English, on the left hand side in, in uh, Welsh, and we'll run through each of these briefly now. What is important, I think, is that in considering an application for the development grant, uh, the uh, intent of that of, of 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 what you propose to spend the money on, uh, uh, you know, uh, it should be related to one or more of these of these themes. And the areas of work in which we're focusing most effort at the moment are the first five, uh, but we have ambitions to move into the sixth, into our highest carbon emitting peatlands in in uh, in coming years. So peat erosion, um, and this is one of the spectacular eroded landscapes in Wales. Uh, a whole range of factors uh, uh, 
lead to this um, state, uh, quite a complex kind of cocktail of factors really. And the most obvious sign of it is the mass loss of peat from the landscape and that profile that's sitting in front of us there uh, that will typically on average have taken around about 5,000 years to accumulate. So this is an irreversible loss really of ancient stored carbon from the landscape and one which we're uh, very keen to um, um, greatly reduce if not to try and reverse through fresh peat accumulation if we can and in a, a vertical image this is what this looks like these are really quite spectacular landscapes fortunately it's not a hugely extensive problem in Wales uh, around about 500 hectares we think um, but of course where it does occur it can be a very um, significant in, environmental um, problem uh, and linked to that if I just move that little banner at the top um, is um sorry i'm just having a little tiny little glitch yeah thank you uh yeah is uh peatland uh, drainage uh so some of our eroded landscapes uh are essentially acting as drains because water flows through those gullies and um we use a whole range of techniques to try and uh, hold water back within those gullies through through gully blocking uh, and we also focus uh, restoration effort in areas where drains have been have been deliberately cut in the past for drainage. And this is quite a, a spectacular deep drain on a peatland in, in uh, North Wales. Uh, we found over the last couple of decades, us and our partners, that uh, uh, grazing and uh, uh, measures to uh, uh, re-wet peatlands can still uh, coexist. Um, so this is a thing that we're, we're keen to kind of, uh, you know, carry on um, uh, progressing across Wales. There's still a lot of, of work to do. Um, strongly linked to this uh, are the ways in which we might begin to better manage some of our more degraded upland peatlands uh, with a particular focus on, on contexts such as the one I'm showing you here, which are strongly dominated by uh, purple more grass millennia. Uh, which typically forms uh, a dense thatch like this, which is of limited uh, grazing value and is unlikely to be, uh, in many cases, peat forming to any great extent. So we're very keen to um, to work on that. Uh, and that might include a range of techniques uh, such as mowing access routes onto peatlands for grazing uh, animals. Um, uh, and of course, the actual uh, reintroduction or changes to the grazing regime on upland peatlands um, as well, all with the intent really of reducing the, the overabundance of millennia and getting a more diverse sward, which includes uh, peat forming mosses such as the um, such as the sphagna. Um, and linked to this um, is our, uh, we're increasingly seeing a role for um, raising um, uh, water levels um, to, to an extent on these millennia dominated peatlands using low contour bunding, which is shown in this uh, in this image here. The lowland counterpart of the upland work um, is, is just as important. Our lowland peatlands, although less extensive than the uplands, hold a great deal of the biodiversity um, interest and the very significant depth of peat which many of these places uh, support is, is also important. Um, so in many cases this involves grazing management and often the reintroduction of grazing as well as uh, control over nutrient income from surrounding land and uh, uh, trying to reverse hydrological uh, damage. And then the last two of our priority action themes, uh, this is the first, uh, a forested peatlands, uh, quite a large amount of uh, our upland peatland resource is um, a forested uh, and this usually has to be accompanied by drainage to enable um, tree growth um, and that's been, uh, that, that's been um, uh, uh, certainly an issue in terms of peatland degradation. So a lot of the focus of the programme uh, staff our, ourself has been on restoring uh, forested peatlands um, across Wales. Uh, and this is a, a, a kind of image of the kind of site uh, we often begin to restore. So that has had a tree crop grown on it. It's had quite extensive drainage, uh, a lot of uh, brash and a lot of stumps and root plates left. So these are quite challenging places to um, to restore. And then our final uh, context uh, are these uh, really very heavily modified peatlands. And this is shown by the uh, uh, image on the right. This is a deep drained um, 
uh, peatland which is losing carbon at, uh, uh, at quite a, a rate due to the drainage and it's estimated in East Anglia where these are also um, used for arable cropping that uh, around about two centimetres of peat per annum is actually being lost uh, so the land surface is dropping which of course also makes it more prone to flooding. So that's a very quick um, gallop really through our priority action themes and at this point I hand over to my colleague uh, Esther. Great. Okay, um, so I'm just going to run through um, what this grant's about, um, who's eligible um, and what can and cannot be included in the applications. So the idea of these development grants um, are to be able to provide some funding to design restoration projects and um, to do the preparation uh, in order to um, use that for future uh, delivery grant funding. Um, MPAP's focus is on Peatland Action, on their capital delivery of restoration work, but we really felt through the first two years of, of MPAP that it was important to be able to provide some funding opportunities um, to give people the time and the opportunities to um, explore feasibility for peatland restoration projects and to develop a fully costed peatland restoration project plan um, and designs and in this case um, for this particular grant the idea is to have that ready um, at the end of the project by January 2025 by which time um, we'd be looking at um, launching further grant funding um, next year there we go. So who can apply? It's pretty much everyone really. This gives individuals, public sector organisations, charities, universities, third sector and private sector um, organisations the opportunities to uh, develop plans for peatland restoration on either land that they own or that is owned uh, that they have permission to work. Um, the only contingency here really is that the lead applicants must either show evidence that they've delivered at least one peatland restoration project in the last decade or that they've got technical support from some body, a partner that has experience of delivering peatland restoration on the ground so that that technical support is is there um, and confirmation of that would be required with the with the application. Um, so what can you spend the grant on? Um, details of this are also on the website. Um, mapping, site surveying to required to design the um, the restoration um, project. Uh, identification of where the peat is, how deep the peat is, um, and communication also with um, stakeholders and land managers. Um, it's especially important um, when working on land uh, where you're not the owner um, to ensure that all of those consents are in place um, so that you have a project that is shovel, shovel ready um, and viable. Um, technical designs for restoration, costing of the restoration project um, and develop of specifications for the restoration work are all included, as well as development of health and safety um, considerations um, for a, a capital works project. So there's a few things that aren't included and there's quite a lot of detail here. As I say, it's available for you to pour over on the website, but I think the main thing is that the focus here is on preparation for delivery of capital works, um, which means that things that can't be funded are those for revenue costs that aren't linked to that capital delivery plan. Um, survey or monitoring that isn't linked to that delivery of the capital works. Um, unfortunately, comms, visitor panels, those sorts of things. They're really important, I agree, but unfortunately not, um, not something that this particular grant um, can be used for. Um, and the work, of course, has to be inside Wales. <clears throat> okay, so the important one here is the timelines. Um, so the grant call was launched on the 13th um, of October. 
and window will close on the 15th of January next year, 2024. Um, estimated award date um, after assessment of those applications, that should be ready towards the end of February 2024. And the project will then run until the mid-January 2025. So the end point um, for the for the project is that there's a, a copy or um, shared with um, with MPAP of the final restoration design proposal and confirmation that all the necessary permissions are in place. For example, consents for grazing, um, landowner permissions to do the work. Um, Additionally, we really would be very grateful um, if any survey work to identify and confirm the presence of peatland can also be shared back with us in GIS format. And an estimate of the hectares of restoration um, that could be achieved through the restoration plan. Um, so we appreciate that um, restoration takes some time to achieve as a uh, as, as completed um, thing. So we'd be wanting to know how much area of peatland has been put on that trajectory to recovery um, through through the planned restoration works. Um, applications are um, eligible from across Wales. Um, for these grants, there will be uh, a greater scoring, a higher score. Um, for areas for applications outside of the national parks. Um, so part of the um, part of the rationale for these competitive grants is to allow individuals who are outside of the, the boundaries of the national parks to be able to apply for funding as well as the parks. A um, couple of lessons learnt that we felt that we like to share. Um, things to be aware of when you're making your applications. Please do remember to mention any other funding that could be perceived as double funding. Um, that wouldn't be appropriate. Um, don't try and blend multiple sources of NRW funding through separate streams. Um, and having that transparency is going to be important in the applications. Um, if you do want to work on NRW lands, just bear in mind that MPAP won't be able to provide full support on resolving permissions um, or design issues. Um, there are teams, for example, for spelling licenses who would need to be approached um, by the applicants individually. Um, and just to note, please um, include peak competitive in correspondence. Um, just so that we're all clear on which grant and you'll be given a grant number on award. Um, so just to cite that in all correspondence. And I think that leaves me to hand over to Anne Wen, who's going to talk about the, the process. Thank you, Esther. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Anne Wen Hughes. I work in the grants assessment and monitoring team and we're responsible for arranging assessment of your application and monitoring progress of any awards that are made. Um, so I'll, I'll now take you through a few slides to provide you with an overview of our application process. Um, so I'll just wait for this to move along. There we are. So our, our grants process is designed around Cabinet Office guidance, which determines six key steps that we follow through the life of a grant. Um, it takes us from design and development right through to final evaluation. And we're currently at the market engagement step of the process. To ensure that we are fair and consistent to all applicants, we need to keep a clear separation of duties. And so you may be involved with different NRW colleagues at different stages of this process. Uh, the link to our application form is now online, so you'd be completing that electronically. Uh, in order to make an application, you'll first of all need to request a reference number. 
to do this, you'll need to go to the Peatland grant page and include it in the section on how to apply. There's a green button that you can click on to request your reference number. An email will then be sent to you by our grants team, which will include your reference number and links to the application form and links to templates and additional guidance pages. If you have any queries at any stage, please direct these to the grants inquiries email address, as this will help us maintain an appropriate separate level of separation of duty and prevent delays later in the process. <clears throat> So our application form is tailored in a way that will only ask you the relevant information based on partner type. Uh, there are four sections within the form and you have the option to save the information as you complete it, allowing you to return to it later. There are certain fields where you'll be prompted to upload information such as project plan and cost breakdown templates, as well as identification documents if you're applying as an individual. The deadline for submitting, submitting your application is midnight on the 15th of January 2024. And as this is a competitive round, we can only accept applications submitted up until that point. <clears throat> so part A will ask you for your details, so name, address and company information if applicable. If you're applying as an individual, then we'll also need to request a copy of a recent utility bill and certified copy of your passport or driving license to confirm your identity. If you're applying as a third sector organisation, you'll need to upload your governing documents. <clears throat> so part B is all about the detail of your proposal. So project title, description of the work you want to do, project start and end dates and the amount being requested from us. You'll need to detail any permissions and consents as required and demonstrate how your proposal meets the criteria of the grant. In this section, there will be an option to upload location maps and you will also need to upload a completed project plan template, which I'll go into a bit further along. <clears throat> So part C is about how you will manage your project and you will be asked to describe the main risks and how you plan to manage them. If you have any formal delivery partners, you will be asked to up upload a copy of any signed agreements along with any of the policies that may be relevant, such as equality and diversity or Welsh language policy. <clears throat> The final part of the application is the detail around the funding arrangements and we'll ask you to specify if you are in receipt of or have applied for any other funding for this project. You'll also be asked to complete and upload a cost breakdown sheet and that will give us the full cost of the project and how, how it's to be funded. If you are a newly formed organisation of less than six months and do not have a set of accounts, we'll need the last three months bank statements or a letter from your bank confirming you've opened an account with them. In this section, you'll also be able to upload your statutory accounts, procurement policy and subsidy control declaration if they apply. Um, you will also need to declare any potential conflicts of interest. So it's really important for you to inform us of any conflicts of interest or, or things that could be perceived as conflicts of interest, as this will help us take the necessary precautions to ensure that our project assessors and panel are not conflicted. Um, an example of a conflict would be if you were related to an NRW employee, for example. Um, failure to declare any conflicts is likely to cause delays to the process, which we clearly want to avoid. So this slide here gives you an example of the detail that we, we need specified in the project plan. So this, this is something that you'll need to complete and upload in part B of your application form. Your project plan is all about showing us the logic of how your proposal will ultimately deliver against the outcomes. So the activities in the activity column, you'll need to specify the things that you'll be doing, which will be will lead to the outputs, the actual products that are produced in the course of the grant. 
um, the plan should be grouped according to claim periods, which should then feed into the claim profile of your cost breakdown template. As this is a, a relatively short delivery window, you can choose to have one claim at the end of the project, or you can choose to have interim claims. And in that, in that case, you would have a row for each claim period in this project plan. So depending on the frequency of the claims, we may request additional updates to monitor the progress of your grant. So for all outputs, you'll need to provide evidence to support, support and evidence the outputs. Um, this could be in the form of an invoice, a report, a copy of a consent perhaps. And if, if, if the application is successful, the outputs and evidence will form part of your award letter, along with claim values and dates. So ultimately, the work you do and the outputs that are produced should lead to longer term outcomes that will deliver for the programme. These outcomes may be longer than the life of the grant, such as restored peatland. So this slide shows you um, an example of the cost breakdown sheets. So this is a spreadsheet that's um, available on the, on the internet pages. Um, <clears throat> and you'll be asked to upload this in section D of the application form. So this is essentially split into four sections. The first section is for project expenditure. And you'll need to detail the full cost of the project here using the relevant expenditure categories, which are listed in a drop down menu within the category column. If there's any expenditure that is not included in our menus, you may enter this in the cell which says other and then provide us with a description of what that cost is. NRW currently allows up to 15% of project staff costs to be claimed as overheads. Believe your overheads will be greater. Please ask us to provide you with an additional form which allows us to consider claims for full cost recovery. It's important to provide us as much detail as possible here. For example, if you have multiple staff members working on the project, please detail these separately along with their role in the project and an approximation of the time that they will spend on, on the work described. Similarly, if you have different consultants working on different elements, then it's also best to break this down as much as possible. The next section is project funding cash section. It's where you would detail any additional funding you have or are aiming to secure to fund the project. So any amount detailed here when added to the amount being requested from NRW should add up to the total project costs. Whilst this grant does offer up to 100% funding, we will also look favourably on any match funding provided. So any volunteer time will need to be detailed in the next section. Um, you'll need to enter the roles against the headings of unskilled, skilled and professionally qualified. Uh, please note these headings relate to the role being undertaken rather than credentials of, of the indi individuals themselves. The final section of this template is your pro proposed claim profile. So we'll review this as part of the assessment and su suggest amendments if they don't appear feasible. Please note that the final claim date cannot be any later than the 15th of January 2025. So as a public body, NRW pays in arrears as standard. But in exceptional circumstances, we can consider requests for payments in advance. If this is something you would like us to consider, please indicate this alongside the claim date in the claim profile. Please note that any requests for payments in advance will require an assessment of the need, and there is no guarantee that we can accommodate this request. Please ensure you familiarise yourself with grant information pages so that your project plan and cross breakdown meet the specific requirements. For example, the value of the grant, so a minimum of £10,000 and a maximum of £30,000. And your final claim date is to be no later than the 15th of January 2025. So the earliest, yeah, whilst we aim to award by, by the end of February 2024, the earliest your project can start is the 1st of April 2024. 
and it must be completed and claimed by the 15th of January 2025. So once we receive your application, we'll be conducting some initial checks before undertaking a fi financial assessment. So NLW's financial assessment is completed by the NLW's grants team. It's tailored based on partner type and includes standard due diligence checks, proportionate based on value and risk. We cover know your applicants. So this may include checking a company's status or reviewing identification documents for individuals. Financial health, this could include reviewing an applicant's accounts and undertaking credit checks. Also includes other sources of funding where we would determine if there are any other sources of funding, both internal and external, and also ensuring compliance with the subsidy control regime. So areas of special concern, we would also look at um, including reviewing any potential conflicts of interest in this particular section. So in parallel with completing the financial assessment, we will also arrange for the application to be sent on to two assessors who will review the proposal and score against specific questions. So details of the questions and scoring are provided on, on the relevant web pages. An assessment panel meeting will then be arranged to ensure consistency and rank all projects by score before making final recommendations for funding. If your proposal is successful, we will issue the award letter via DocuSign and you have up to 28 days to check the details and return this to us as authorised. A welcome pack will also be sent to you to provide you with further guidance on managing your grant and to include links to the templates needed to submit and evidence your claims. You will also be introduced to your grant delivery officer and also key contacts in the grants team. If you are not successful this time, we will write to you and provide you with some feedback where possible. So where to get help? If you need any further guidance to help prepare your application, please refer to the grant guidance pages on the internet pages. You can also contact the grants team who will co coordinate a response to your query. Please do not contact any NRW staff directly as this may delay the process due to our need to maintain separation of duties. And so that completes my overview of the grants and application process. I hope that was helpful. I'll just leave you with this final slide to take a note of the grants email address for any queries to be submitted. And now I'll hand back over to you, Pete and Esther.